U.S. President Donald Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un will meet tomorrow for their highly anticipated summit in Singapore. For the summit to be productive, the negotiations need to converge on the lowest common denominator shared interest that both parties can agree on. We saw this in the inter-Korean summit, where South Korean President Moon Jae-in and Kim Jong-un settled on easy win confidence building measures as the starting point for more substantive negotiations. Given the extreme and long-standing trust deficit between the US and DPRK, it is not clear where Trump and Kim might find this lowest common denominator to unlock a confidence-building pathway. Because of that, this summit is shaping as compelling viewing as a spectacle, and perplexing in its ambiguous purpose. North Korea is not committed to denuclearization as the concept has been understood by the Trump administration. The North Korean interpretation of a nuclear-free Korea implies the full simultaneous nuclear weapons relinquishment by all nuclear powers, including the United States. While still campaigning for the Republican candidacy, Mr. Trump tells CBS News that he would get China to make that guy, Kim Jong-un, disappear then presidential candidate Trump is pictured above following an interview with Reuters in which he said, with regards to Mr. Kim, I would speak to him, I have no problem speaking to him in his New Year address, Mr. Kim boasts that North Korea's nuclear force is capable of thwarting and countering any nuclear threats from the United States adding that in no way would the United States dare to ignite a war against me and our country North Korea fires four ballistic missiles into the sea near Japan, following joint military exercises between the US and South Korea. It is feared that North Korea will develop an intercontinental ballistic missile capable of reaching the US. Mr. Kim celebrates the test launch of the Song-14 intercontinental ballistic missile, which is capable of reaching Alaska amidst claims of advancing nuclear capabilities from North Korea. Mr. Trump states that further threats would be met with fire and fury like the world never seen Mr. Kim response to Mr. Trump's threat of fire and fury by threatening the U.S. territory of Guam, home to one of the most significant U.S. military bases in the Pacific. With enveloping fire in his first United Nations address, Mr. Trump states that Rocket Man is on a suicide mission for him and his regime. Mr. Trump repeated the nickname in a tweet later in the month. Mr. Kim responded to the president's UN speech in a lengthy diatribe that ended with the line I will surely and definitely tame the mentally deranged US dotard with fire. Dotard, a word that had been largely forgotten by the English-speaking world, refers to an old person, particularly one who is weak or senile Mr. Trump seemingly hurt by Mr. Kim's reference to his age, assures the world that he just wants to be friends with the short and fat North Korean leader following Mr. Kim's claim that his nuclear button is constantly prepared. Mr. Trump asserts that his nuclear button is bigger and more powerful than the North Korean one Chung Yui Yong, head of South Korea's National Security Office, visits the White House and passes on an invitation for Mr. Trump to meet with Mr. Kim in Singapore Mr. Trump accepts the invitation, setting the date for the summit as June 12, 2018 Mr. Trump cancels the meeting, citing tremendous anger and open hostility from Mr. Kim as the reason Mr. Trump announces that the meeting is back on, telling reporters that we're going to deal, and we are really going to start a process, adding I look forward to the day that I can take the sanctions off North Korea here, North Korea can speak the language language of denuclearization without ever having to commit to complete, verifiable, irreversible denuclearization CVID. The problem with Trump's insistence on COVID is that there is no mutually agreeable starting point for a discussion with North Korea on those terms. 
there is no outcome in which the regime willingly relinquishes its nuclear weapons program, because the Kim regime is so heavily invested in nuclear weapons as the foundation of its security strategy, economic development pathway, and domestic political legitimacy. The only real concession of value that Washington has to offer Kim is a formal treaty to conclude the Korean War. Indeed, Trump has hinted that the signing of a document to close hostilities is a possibility, though he stopped short of offering a formal peace treaty. What does North Korea have to offer the United States, short of denuclearization? We have seen gestures of goodwill in the lead up to the summit. North Korea's recently demolished tunnels at its Pungiri nuclear test site are a gesture of goodwill to Washington, offering up a now obsolete facility. This echoes a similar concession by Pyongyang in 2008, when it demolished the cooling tower of the obsolete reactor at Yongbyon. Negotiations may settle on a nuclear fusion or missile testing moratorium, in addition to other smaller security-related confidence-building measures. The North released three American citizens to Secretary of State Mike Pompeo on a recent visit to Pyongyang. The Americans had been detained in the DPRK on accusations of espionage. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and South Korean President Moon Jae-in raise their hands after signing on a joint statement Kim Jong-un heads towards Moon Jae-in to shake his hand between the military demarcation line. At the joint security area on the demilitarized zone in the border village of Panmunjom in Paju South Korean President Moon Jae-in and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un hold hands as they cross the military demarcation line South Koreans react while watching a screen report the inter-Korean summit South Korean President Moon Jae-in and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un chat as they arrive at the Peace House North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un was escorted by bodyguards from the north to the military demarcation line that divides the two Koreas to meet with his South Korean counterpart at the Truce Village North Korean leader Kim Jong-un crosses the military demarcation line to meet with South Korean President Moon Jae-in Kim Jong-un and Moon Jae-in shake hands North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and South Korean President Moon Jae-in shake hands after Kim crossing the military demarcation line South Korean President Moon Jae-in and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un at the joint security area. South Korean President Moon Jae-in and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un speak with two South Korean children who presented Kim Jong-un with a bouquet of flowers Moon Jae-in Kim Jong-un pose for photographers at the joint security area, JSA, North North Korean leader Kim Jong-un signs the guest book as South Korean President Moon Jae-in looks on North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's entry in the guest book. The writing reads a new history starts now. An age of peace. From the starting point of history South Korean President Moon Jae-in and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un talk during their summit meeting at the Peace House North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un smiles North Korean leader Kim Jong-un poses with South Korean President Moon Jae-in for a photo inside the Peace House North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un talks with South Korea's President Moon Jae-in North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and South Korean President Moon Jae-in prepare to plant a pine tree near the military demarcation line South Korean President Moon Jae-in and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un applaud after planting a tree at the Truce Village North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un and South Korea's President Moon Jae-in take a walk after they planted a tree North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un talks with South Korea's President Moon Jae-in at a bench on a bridge next to the military demarcation line at the Truce Village of Panmunjom North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and South Korean President Moon Jae-in sign on a joint statement North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and South Korean President Moon Jae-in embrace each other after signing on a joint statement North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, left.
and South Korean President Moon Jae-in shake hands after their joint announcement and in a test of Thomas Friedman's tongue-in-cheek theory that no two countries with McDonald's restaurants would ever go to war, Kim may even offer to have McDonald's open a restaurant in Pyongyang. Kim may also court Trump with flattery, as many other world leaders have done to productive effect. Who has the negotiating leverage? Both parties have strengths and weaknesses in their bargaining positions. North Korea has, or is close enough to, a deployable nuclear weapons capability. Kim appears enthusiastic to talk now with the Americans, because in nuclear weapons his government has the strategic leverage it needs. North Korea wants to negotiate a peace agreement with the United States, but on Pyongyang's terms. While it is highly unlikely that Kim begged Trump to reconvene the summit on hands and knees, as Rudy Giuliani has suggested, North Korea does have some incentive to make concessions. Kim's ambitions of developing the North Korean economy under the Byungjin model are constrained by the UN Security Council and bilateral American sanctions regimes. While North Korea has demonstrated an ability to persevere in spite of sanctions, and even grow some niche sectors of its economy, such as the mining sector, Kim's vision for economic development ultimately requires strategic connections with international development partners. The explicit inclusion of references to transportation infrastructure linkages with South Korea in the Panmunjom Declaration from April's Inter-Korean Summit illustrates this point. Trump promises very interesting Singapore nuclear summit similarly, there are limitations on American action that constrain its negotiating options, most notably, the strategic vulnerability of Seoul to North Korean bombardment. The absence of a substantive relationship between the US and North Korea also limits Washington's economic and diplomatic leverage. Rightly or wrongly, the US has dealt itself out of direct influence over North Korea through its various policies of strategic isolation and maximum pressure. It is ironic that US officials have consistently urged China to do more to pressure North Korea and uphold the integrity of the sanctions regime, when it has been economic interactions between the DPRK and China that have had the most demonstrable impact on politics in Pyongyang. However, the clear power disparity between the US and DPRK is often overlooked. As the more powerful party with overwhelming nuclear superiority and clear capacity to deter any North Korean nuclear threat, the US does have capacity to reset the terms of the relationship by reducing the heat in negotiations. Trump can do this by changing the focus of the negotiations. If it insists on covert to the bitter end, the Trump administration will blow an opportunity to meaningfully change the strategic goalposts on the Korean peninsula by focusing on the wrong prize. Who else is playing a role? With such ambiguity over potential outcomes from the summit, other regional players are lobbying hard around the edges to represent their interests. South Korea's diplomatic efforts in 2018 have been geared to guiding the US into a more conciliatory position with North Korea. This would make it politically safer for Trump to negotiate for an agreement with Pyongyang, knowing there are influential American officials in Trump's ear counseling for war. Moon Jae-in has been busy maintaining the diplomatic momentum generated by the Inter-Korean summit, from his tactical ego-stroking comments about Trump deserving the Nobel Peace Prize to visiting Washington to lobby the president directly. Moon has even flagged that he may travel to Singapore for the summit, 
knowing South Korea is best positioned to facilitate confidence building with the DPRK. Conversely, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has also been engaging in shuttle diplomacy, urging Trump to follow a tougher line. North Korea's WMD and missile threat to Japan, and resolution of the abducting issue, are core interests of the Abe administration. Indeed, an adversarial North Korea better suits Abe's domestic agenda for Japanese strategic normalization, which would be undercut by rapprochement between Washington and Pyongyang. It is also interesting to see that former NBA star Dennis Rodman may be an attendee at the summit. While Rodman has been lampooned in some quarters for his sports diplomacy and relationship with Kim Jong-un, he nonetheless has a level of access to and a unique rapport with the North Korean leader that is largely unmatched by anyone else within the American foreign policy establishment. As an ambassador of goodwill, Rodman could help the parties find that common interest. Also significant is the non-invitation of U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton. His recent comments comparing North Korea to Libya appear to be a deliberate attempt to undercut the State Department's groundwork with Pyongyang over the past few months. American hawks such as Bolton view any kind of engagement with North Korea as a loss or appeasement, one of the most juvenile and misapplied terms in the international relations lexicon. They are well aware of the difficulty of getting any negotiated deal ratified in a Republican majority Congress, recalling the fate of the agreed framework. The irony is a deal is more likely to stick in the US if it is owned by a Republican president. My view is that North Korea can be deterred as a nuclear power, and a peace treaty to formally end the Korean War represents the best pathway to managing regional security and ensuring the safety of the people who live in the region. Inside Kim Jong-un's palatial Singapore pad it is under the umbrella of a formalized peace regime that human rights concerns within North Korea are more likely to be addressed, coupled with continued pressure from international human rights advocates. Engagement and interaction is the best vehicle for this, based on an understanding of interrelationships of complex material, financial and ecological flows and networks that are shaping social change processes within the DPRK. Summits are symbols that act as markers in a much broader process of relationship building. They are based on confidence building measures and clear, achievable implementation steps. Through such a process, the parties could gradually evolve the level of trust necessary to progress to subsequent steps on the negotiation pathway. It is unclear in the build-up to this unprecedented summit if the participants will be able to hack away the thicket of decades of mistrust and hostility to identify common interests. We will find out on Tuesday if Trump and Kim can find that lowest common denominator on which to build a peace regime on the Korean Peninsula. Benjamin Habib is a lecturer in international relations at La Trobe University. This piece originally appeared on The Conversation.